Good evening and welcome to the Journey Home program. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this weekly program when I have, which I have the great privilege of introducing to you men and women who because of their great love for Jesus Christ were drawn home to the Catholic Church. Our guest tonight is actually a neighbor of mine. It, it took a while to get uh, Carolyn Shermerhorn to uh, come onto the program. I don't think you weren't the one resisting, it was just, that, uh, it was just the Never timing. Happened. It was just an issue of timing. And it's good to have you on the program. Carolyn's a former non-denominational, actually uh, returning Catholic. So she'll yes. talk about that in a moment. But remember, you're an important part of this program. So let's begin by giving you the phone numbers, 1-800-221-9460. And outside North America, 205-271-2980. And if you'd like to send us an email, you can do it, journeyhome at EWTN. Dot com. Carolyn, welcome to the Journey Home program. Thank you, Marcus. I, I've said this many times to different guests, but some of us, you know, we all live in Ohio, and then we don't see each other until we come down here to EWTN. Right. Well, you live half an hour away. Of course, you see the rest of my family more than you see me yes. because of our children yes. and uh, talking farms and other stuff that we share in our interests together. Mm -hmm. But is this your first time at EWTN? Uh, this is the second time, actually. Pilgrimaged here about... 12 years ago. Is that right? Yeah. Well, that's mm -hmm. close to when you came into the church. Right? Very, very close afterward, actually. Yes. All right. Well, let's back up a bit. And every program, I begin by asking the guest to give us a summary of the early spiritual journey. Well, I think mine started very typically. I was raised in your post-Vatican II Catholic home. I have four brothers, and, and uh, my parents gave us a great moral upbringing, we went to church every Sunday, we had all the holy days, um, had all my sacraments at the right time, and unlike most of my contemporaries, I could even look up a Bible verse by the time I was a freshman in <laughs> high school. <laughs> that was because of your own desire, because of the way you were taught in CCD? Um, actually, I think I had a few good teachers in uh, CCD, and, and they imparted a lot of, of love to me, but there was still a lot I didn't know. And um, I, was, I went away to a Catholic scripture camp when I was a sophomore a in high Catholic school. Yes, camp. I did. Wow. And one night was talking to one of the directors, asking her in a very adult way, so how do you think the camp is going? And she said, oh, it's wonderful. We've actually had a child who gave her life to Jesus. And I kind of hesitated and I was like, really? <laughs> And in the back of my head, I was thinking, are they trying to make nuns and priests out of people here? Because I'm out of here really fast. <laughs> and that, wa that wasn't it. I, I think she was a charismatic Catholic who was really just trying to get kids in touch with having a relationship with our Lord. And little did I know, I was the next one on the list. And the following night, uh, she talked about that need to turn your life over to Christ and instead of making him just part of the periphery of your life with everything else that's centered around you that making a step to deciding that Christ is the center and you were on the outside so I, I think that was the beginning of my walk when was this how old uh, 15 years old um, of course came home very excited about Jesus and everything and I don't know that my parents quite know what to think about at that time. <laughs> Maybe I'd been brainwashed or something, I don't know. Um, but one good thing that it did for me is having that identity of a born-again Christian, really, even though I was a Catholic. Um, having the identity of a born-again Christian brought me into contact with a lot of really good people. And those were the people I ended up surrounding myself with throughout high school and then into college. And in surrounding myself with those other Christians, kind of learned to talk Christianese and, you know, said things like, Christ laid it on my heart to do this or that. And, and there was just kind of a language between us all that we understood about being born again and uh, the poor rest of the world who was so unsaved. And no, let me um, ask you this, when you say these Christians, these were mm -hmm. more of an ecumenical group of folk. They were. They were very ecumenical. I, I In the sense that there was no, the distinctions between where you were coming from was downplayed? Yes. Yes. It was all about Jesus, okay. which was very good. 
Um, I think on the downside, when we would study the Word, there was always that understanding of it, it's all right here. I mean, mm. you read it for yourself and you will understand it. Mm. If it's here, then it's truth. And if you can't find it here, it's not truth. But I don't think we were all equipped mm. to give each other that kind of wisdom mm. and knowledge, especially in an early part of our walk. Yeah. But that's, that's how we grew. Mm. And um, of course, through the course of that, things start to creep in. And I don't think anyone ever intended to be anti-Catholic, but I'm surrounded by Christian contemporary music. I'm listening to radio evangelists, going to Bible studies on campus. And it was inevitable that it was started, we started questioning, my friend and I, who was kind of on this journey with me, uh, we both started questioning a little, like, you know, what about this? church we've been raised in. Is, is this really a healthy place to be? Um, do, do we really, are, are we being fed in this church? I remember that, that was a big that question. Very common yeah. phrase. Yeah. Being fed. And we knew a lot of kids even then who had left the church for all those reasons. Um, mass was boring and they, they weren't being fed and, mm -hmm. and they'd found a lot of excitement elsewhere and they left the church. It was interesting. They would look at us and say, so what are you doing in the Catholic Church? It, I mean, isn't it obvious you need to leave? And we'd say, well, somebody needs to stay back and save those poor Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of where we started, and it, it just snowballed from there. I think um, by the time I married, um, at the age of 22, I had a, a, an awful lot of questions in my mind that just weren't were no longer answered, and actually they weren't even questions anymore. They were they were they were jabs mm -hmm. that I would take at the church. Um, you know, they worship Mary. I mean, come on. Um, they uh, they feel like they have to dial God's phone number every time they start a prayer. I mean, is that superstition or what? Um, the whole baptism issue of baptizing a child who doesn't even know enough about the faith to make a decision. How terrible is that? And I wasn't even attending an Orthodox church. Imagine what I would have thought had I really known that that was Jesus on the altar. Yeah. An Orthodox had Catholic I known church people, well, I, mean, I was, even, you meant it I was in a Catholic church, church yeah, right. but um, never saw anyone praying a rosary or anything yeah. like that. So these were just observations along the way. So by the time I married, it, well, my husband was entering the army and it was a very convenient time because I was no longer in my home church. You know, there had been certain expectations as long as we were at, at home in the church I'd been raised in and received my sacraments in and been married in. And you really couldn't leave. So we got married and went away, and it was time to kind of dabble and, and see what else was out there. Yeah. Now um, your husband, Kelly, was, was Catholic, right? Yeah, interestingly, Kelly had been raised Catholic as a child, but um, then as a young adult, he had followed his mother, who was a Methodist, and yeah. so was no longer in the church. He'd come back to the church for me, in a way. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. kind of joined church choir, and that's, that's where the whole romance blossomed. Um, but it was a decision we made together, and there was just an excitement lacking. A lot of that was because I'd been introduced to a very charismatic yeah. worship style which is beautiful and, and I, I still love very much today. It still um, has touched my life in many ways. The problem was that the charismatic group that we were involved in was not grounded in anything Catholic. It was in a Catholic church, but it was very ecumenical. And so after a time, going to church meant going to prayer meeting because that was very exciting and it was just rah rah and you know you walk out of there on a high and it was all very wonderful and loud which is what I liked. Um, mass by comparison just seemed terribly boring and we would walk into mass and you know do a half-hearted genuflection and sit there and I'd be thinking these people are not 
excited to be here. I'm accustomed to being somewhere where people are excited to be. And, uh, and there's no Bible teaching going on. I mean, a mass is an hour sure. long of one Bible text <laughs> after another. And somehow I never didn't picked up on it. that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I didn't pick up on that. Um, so it was a very natural step for us once we left and we were in the Army to look into that non denom kind of a feel. And uh, by the time our first daughter was born, we were in a church, a new church, it's really a group of folks, that was meeting in a little elementary gymnasium. And boy, they could sing their hearts out. Yeah. They really could. And, and we saw some remarkable things happen there. There was a lot of warmth among those people. They were very genuine Christians. And uh, if that pastor got a hold of the wind of the Holy Spirit on a given Sunday, by golly, you might be there for a while. But it was very <laughs> exciting that way. It was kind of impetuous, you know. Um, moved to Fayetteville, North Carolina. Joined a big Pentecostal church there. That was powerful. This was pump up the volume church. <laughs> Just very exciting and, and exactly where I wanted to be because you, you went in and you were fed and you praised Jesus and you worshiped and you walked out of there and, and you're just, whoo, it was just yeah. very exciting. And then if, if the pressures of the world were too much, there was another meeting Wednesday night you could go to. And it just kind of spoon feeding it to you all the way. And it was, it was just warm and exciting and, and full of expression which I really loved. And an un uninhibited praise of God. Yes. Maybe the best way to describe it. Yes. And, uh, and no, this no holds barred. And no holds yep. barred. This, yep. was, this was dancing in the aisles kind yep. of church. Right. I'm not dancing for you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I didn't That's do that anymore. Right. We don't have the wide camera, but to uh, <laughs> yeah. kind of get the full uh, effect here. Um, would you, before we move on to what it is that opened your heart to the church, as you look back to that time, uh, it seems to me that this was a similar journey that I've encountered many times for mm -hmm. many Catholics who've left the church. I mm -hmm. mean, did you, when you look back to that time when you were making that, were a lot of these people that were dancing in the aisles with you ex-Catholics? Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. they were. And yeah. Same reasons, probably. Yeah, it, it's that excitement element. Um, honestly, I don't think there was any theology behind it yeah. at all, which my reasons for returning the church <coughs> later really mm -hmm. delve into a lot of that. Um, See, often what, what isn't noticed in these non-denominational is the, the phrase is a mile wide and an inch deep because, it, you know, you have this feeling, mm -hmm. <coughs> you know, of great... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, commitment and excitement, but the depth, because it's non-denominational. So you, right? I mean, yes. all the different people coming in, there's so many doctrines that you have to keep pushing aside mm -hmm. because this group of people don't want to go there. So, okay, we won't go there. And then pretty soon it, it comes down to the least common denominator, mm -hmm. which is Jesus and, and mm -hmm. being excited about Jesus, mm -hmm. his love for you. And, mm -hmm. and, and the word. Yeah. But, but I think even, and, and I, I hesitate to say the word is limited because this is God's yeah, word. Yeah. God's word certainly isn't limited. But, but we were limited to yeah, our limited, yeah. interpretation of what the English says yeah. on the page and, and never really even realizing it. I mean, I, I would look back to what I'd seen in the church as I was growing up and I'd think, well, I, that's not my concordance. I can't find yeah. it. So. Obviously, that's not of God. I, I think I was sincere. I, I really do right. believe I, I gained a great love of our Lord during that time. And I, I think it's just his great mercy that would meet me where I was. And Kelly was very much in this too. Oh, he was. He was. I, th I think we were both very impressed to, to walk in and, and just, just the warmth of the people that would surround us. and. Uh, we saw some powerful things happen. Yep. Uh, Pastor John Hedgepeth would get up there and he could preach a sermon. Hmm. He'd, you'd be flying pretty high for a few yep. hours after you left there. It was pretty exciting. 
Well, it's hard to come off, off a high. Yes, it is. Uh, in a sense, uh, because it can be so enticing. Yes. Reminds me of that story in the the the, the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. You know, yes. when, when Edmund gets drawn away for the by the, by the the witch of the winter. You know, the, yeah. the winter witch mm -hmm. drawn by the Alaskan whatever the dessert that he just it, it's so enthralling by that he can't see anything else but that. Mm -hmm. So what is it that opened your heart in the midst of a very powerful, very worshipful, very joyful? Great fellowship, yeah. scripture teaching. Oh, it was beautiful. Well, God used my brother, Chris, and his beautiful wife, Aziza, very powerfully during that time. Um, my brother, while I was kind of making this huge, exciting exit, uh, was learning more and more about his faith mm. and just getting really rooted and, and deeper and deeper into it. And uh, we're very close. He would call me, he'd say, well, we're praying for you so hard and we're just praying that you'll come back home to the church. I would get so mad at him. <laughs> How <laughs> dare you? How dare you bring me back into the church? But I think that's what happened. Um, in a very long, that patient, that loving grace. way. And, and I don't recommend anyone say that to their <laughs> relatives that they're coming back because it really would make me angry. But um, there were a few things that happened during that time, actually. Um, and part of it was the witness of my brother and his family because they, they were very concerned for us, and, and I know that they just... They must have said hours and hours of prayers hmm. for Kelly and I and our children. And um, did you, you did you ever end up debating or talking the faith with him? He or? never did. Okay. He never he never did. You know what he did instead? He he treated me as the sincere Christian that I was, hmm. who who loved the Lord. With, with all my heart and soul and mind that I could. Mm. And he treated that with such dignity that when he would come home from church and say he'd heard a talk on the domestic church, he'd say, oh, we heard this great talk about the domestic church. And isn't it wonderful? I mean, to think of your home as your church and your husband as, as the head of that church. He's the priest in your home and he represents Jesus. And, and he would just talk as if we were there. He, he would give yeah. that to us. And um, it was very effective because, and I, I don't think it was strategizing on yeah. his part at all. Just freely all. planting seeds, just freely giving. Yes, what he had it, it was very, it was just total generosity on his part. Yeah. A realization that I wasn't any less a Christian than he was, but that the church and the path that I was in wasn't, in the end, going to give me the fullness mm. that, that, I, that we wanted mm. so badly. It, was, it wasn't going to fill the void. Mm. And so he, he would just kind of talk like that. <laughs> and, and I wouldn't know how to respond. There was nothing defensive about it. I'd go home and I'd say, he loves the church more than he loves Jesus, honey. And we'd kind of talk about this and then we'd work it out and then we'd go, oh, well, yeah, but what he says makes sense. I mean, b because of the way he approached me with such great dignity and love, with the mercy of Christ, um, the things that he was learning in his faith walk were coming into my home despite, despite me. So I, I think that is probably the biggest thing that was happening is, is just the faithful witness of my brother and his family in my life, in, in our life. Um, a second thing that, that happened there was somebody handed us, and you've probably heard this a million times, a, a tape set by Dr. Scott Hahn. Yep. I mean, um, how powerful yep. those have been over the years. Right. This particular one was a six tape uh, set on the sacraments. Mm -hmm. Know it well. And uh, oh, he, just, he just took one sacrament at a time and showed how it was rooted in the Bible. Hmm. 
and I think, I think to my credit, I, th I think it really does show that I was sincere about wanting to know Jesus because as he showed it from the scriptures, I was totally open to it. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, after just after my brother's faithful witness and then finally hearing these words and not having a chance to debate it or get angry, just mm -hmm. to listen and take it in, I it just, the defenses just kind of fell away. And I, by the time we had gone through that set, um, what could you do? It was like the apostles looking at so Jesus. So Kelly was as open at the same oh, time. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's been really beautiful mm -hmm. that we've been able to share that journey, uh, just a parallel journey every mm -hmm. step. It's been very, very beautiful for both of us. But, um, yeah, we, we were ready then. To, okay. It was like, Lord, where, shall, where else shall we go? You're the Messiah. You're the Son of Did God. Did you then come in, or was it a, a time after that? Or well, um, my, my parents were going to be in town for Christmas. We just had our third child, I think. <laughs> 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 I've had six children. They <laughs> get lost in pregnancy sometimes. <laughs> I'm sure people can relate to that. Um, and the first two children we had had dedicated because, of course, we didn't believe infant baptism. Um, our third child then, it was with her that we were coming back into the church. And uh, we went to our priest and said, okay, we've been gone for a while, and we're ready to come home. And it was kind of scary because he wasn't a real approachable guy. He wasn't, you know, all hugs and kisses and, and everything. In fact, I think he regarded us a little bit with some, um, not disdain, but just like, okay, what are you really doing here? Because he knew my parents were coming uh -huh. back in town, and oh, we were young. asking the children, we were asking for baptism for the children, and he was afraid that we were only doing that just for, for the sake of yep. human respect, for how it was going to look, um, and then, you know, fly right back out of the church. But... He received us in a beautiful way. I, I had no idea what to expect. We went to Father and just explained to him. And once he was satisfied that we really had a heart for what we were coming home to, he said, okay, I'm going to grant you confession first. I was not prepared for that. <laughs> wow, confession, okay. And it was, it was just beautiful. That is how he received us back mm -hmm. into the church. Our children were baptized. We had a lot still yeah. to learn. I, I wasn't ready to have a relationship with, with Mary, my mother, yet. Um, I didn't understand, I, I still didn't understand how the Mass could be so boring if it was so full of truth. That really bothered me. And that was the third thing, I think, that kind of fell into my lap. Um, for, for me anyway, I'm not sure what Kelly would say to that, uh, but somewhere along the way, somebody told me, well, you know, the Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. So get out. <laughs> I was raised in this church. I was never told that. Where are you getting this? And of course, take us to John and go through the scriptures and and pull a little more Scott Hahn on us. And um, that was a paradigm shift. Because when I saw that that is our Lord, the reason for going to church suddenly changed. It, going to church had always been about getting fed, about me, what am I getting out of this? And on any given day, it depended on how awake the preacher was, and if he'd had a good breakfast, and what he'd picked out, and how great the music was, and if I had had breakfast. I mean, it depended on a lot of things, yeah. whether or not you were going to get fed at a given service. And when I realized that if that's Jesus up on the altar, which I believe it is, who am I to go into church and say, what's in it for me? <laughs> and now, we go to Mass, and it's like reliving that first born-again experience, that salvation prayer. Mm -hmm. Every time you go to Mass, you, I, I lay my heart on the altar. 
my Lord's feet and rededicate my life to him every single time. It's interesting you've used the word bored a few times yeah. as the description that you saw. And part of our spiritual journey is, is recognizing that if we're bored, we presume it's a problem with out there. Mm -hmm. But the issue of boredom, it's a problem of in here. Yes. The categories that we're placing on what we're experiencing, well, we are to be the judge of that. That's the flip-flop. Well, where are we in our relationship with God or what's going on in this service? And which is what you said, you know. Mm -hmm. if you, uh, it's sadly this, this modern heresy of, of kind of Jesus and me. Yeah. You know, that alternative gospel where that's really all that's important. Everything else is kind of an add-on or a, a distraction. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just running rampant. And it's not only out there. It can be in the Catholic Church, too. I mean, not the church per se, but us. You know, it's all about me and what I'll get. Well, and why aren't the people around me excited about this? <laughs> you know, there's, there's that verse in, in 2 Timothy. I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. Previous to coming home, what I thought that meant was stir it up, rekindle. You know, it was that woohoo yeah. kind of a spirituality. But that depends a lot on the people around you, too. That you know, There's a lot of periphery going on there, kind of helping each other get all excited. Yeah. And uh, now I see that that rekindling really happens a very deep way. It, it's no longer a spoon, it's not a spoon-fed Christianity in Mass. This is meat, literally. And it takes, you know, concentration, oh, being yes. involved, uh, fighting distractions, the voices that want to pull you away, yes. the voices that want you to doubt, to belittle, and then to be open to what's there. I mean, can you imagine if, uh, if you came into a, a church where John of the Cross and Teresa Valla were mm. sitting there in contemplation, you'd say, what's wrong with you? Why can't you get excited about your faith? Sure, sure. You know, missing the whole thing of where they are in their spiritual life. And that work that you're talking about, that, that you have to put into getting something out of us, that is the gift of yourself. Yeah. That's right. All right, let's take a break. And uh, before we break, though, I want to mention that you have a website, right? Yes. Okay, now what's on this website? Okay. Well, I am a freelance writer, and I, I have a column that I've been writing for two years where I take little spiritual truths and just kind of show them in a vignette of family life, which I have plenty of with six children. <laughs> and so I've put a couple of them up on the website and trying to work on a little self-syndication. So sure. if anyone's interested in seeing what... Okay. Apologista is all about. It's apologista.blogspot.com. Yes. No www dot. No. Right? HTTP slash slash. Right. Uh, colon slash slash apologista.blogspot.com. And it's not a blog in that it's, I, read, I generate something every day. I couldn't possibly right. do that, but <laughs> just want to put it out there. All right. We'll be back just a second with your questions for Christy. Welcome back. We're here with uh, Carolyn Shermer Horn. I'm sorry that I, you know. Sorry. Sometimes I don't have much script on my TV prompter, but mm -hmm. sometimes I like having the phone numbers, which I sometimes forget even after all these years, and then and when my mind is doing seven things at the same time, I sometimes get, get a little mixed up. We're going to go with our first email, I think. Uh, yeah, let's go with our first email. This comes from Ohio, Suzanne oh. in Ohio, Great. and she writes, Dear Carolyn, and Marcus, my husband and I are both converts to the Catholic Church. Well, welcome home, Suzanne. 
one of the things we've struggled with is the lack of friendliness and hospitality we were faced mm. with when we first started going to Mass. We think the charismatic slash Pentecostals apparent joyfulness, enthusiasm is a lot of the draw for Catholics. Mm -hmm. What can you recommend we as Catholics do to fill that void to help others feel the love and warmth that is just under the surface mm -hmm. in Catholic parishes? Thank you, Suzanne, because it is there. That is a great question, and it's one that my teenagers, of all people, have struggled with because they have a lot of friends who are in a big Baptist church, and they do all these cool things. And uh, while my younger son would just probably say, make sure there's donuts and coffee after Mass, that'll do it for him. Um, you know, you're asking Catholics to reach out to converts and I think it's so hard because the nature of our Catholicism is so deep and so personal and there's a lot that happens within our faith that is not outward. But um, on the other hand, Holy Mother Church has given us so many beautiful practices yeah. to share, such as having home blessings, inviting your neighbors over, and um, having virgins, Virgin Fatima statues and, and saying a rosary and inviting families over. I, I think a lot of it is if we would just break out of our busy American culture yeah. and break into what the church is supposed to be living in the secular world, yeah. that we would be a draw. Yeah, busyness is, is not just something that hurts Catholic churches. Oh. It's true across the board. And I will say, having been a pastor of four churches, four Protestant churches, is that that whole fellowship thing can be very surface level too. I mean, yeah. it can feel good, but it can be very shallow very quickly because you can still mm -hmm. hang out with the ones you're closest to. Sometimes I think the problem in the Catholic churches are sometimes they are so big. Oh, yeah. We're talking two, 3,000 mm -hmm. members, 4,000 members in an old church where some of these families have been a member of that ch parish for 100 years that you're sitting in the pew and you see someone you don't know. You don't know if that's their first time there or whether they've been there 50 years before you. I mean, it's hard to know. Or if they just usually go to 9 o'clock Mass and today they're Four Masses on a Sunday. And I mean, yeah. that makes it difficult to reach out. But, it, but is that community aspect really supposed to be happening in church? I, I think that a lot of the writings of Pope John Paul II pointed us in a different direction. I mean, yep. pre-Vatican II all happened in a Catholic neighborhood. That's where Catholic culture happened. And I think that today with the new evangelization, there's more of a call to live your faith fully yep. in your neighborhood and call others to you, not necessarily to church, but yeah, the to danger, your home first. The danger is that the is that the contemplative, reverent atmosphere of the church sanctuary has been turned into a fellowship hall yeah. too often, and maybe an imitation of what they see down the street, but that was not the intent of being in the presence of Christ. And there's a time before mass and a time after mass, and coffee right. and donuts or whatever that's fine, or going out to lunch afterwards, or having a Bible study you know, for young adults or young married, just a thousand yeah. things we can do. Mm -hmm. A thousand mm -hmm. things we can do. We can start them this week. Yes. Just don't change the mass. Yes. That's not the time for fellowship. That's the time for worship. Right. Uh, giving and receiving with our Lord. Uh, but there's plenty of other opportunities. And I can tell you right now that, again, having been a pastor of those other churches, we worked hard to make sure that those other opportunities mm -hmm. were there. It took a lot of work. It didn't just happen. Let's take this next phone call. Frank from Pennsylvania. Hello, Frank. What's your question tonight? Yes, Marcus. Uh, I love your program. It's my only must program. <laughs> Thanks, Frank. Uh, if a priest uh, with Carolyn had given more depth and, and beauty in her homilies and in conversation with her, would she have left? And what would Carolyn and you advise? Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Would I have left if our priest had been... If the homilies were deeper, more... Uh, more exciting. The music or something, would that have... Let's go, but his comment was on the, the, the depth of the teaching. I think that had I known that the church was rooted in Scripture, 
make sure that the scripture is rooted in the church. Right. Um, I don't think I would have fallen away so easily. I don't think it would have depended so much on the charisma of that preacher as it would have just depended on knowledge. I, I had no knowledge. Formation. Formation. So you look back and you think that's probably one of the keys that why you drifted away because the issue of formation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Even today, I, um, a lot of times I'm having apologetical discussions or debates with people. I'm having to teach myself still because I, I didn't have that formation. Yeah. So definitely, if there was solid formation and teaching coming from the pew, I think that I would have been less apt to leave. And the examples you gave earlier were, were interesting. Mary, that oh. you brought up Catholic, you, you, then you thought you worshiped, Catholic, you worshiped Mary. You thought that. <laughs> Even though I'd never said a rosary. <laughs> but you thought that that's what Catholics yes. did. And, and you didn't yes. quite understand, why are we doing the sign the of the cross? The simplest things. Yes. We take it for granted. Instead of using them as a teachable moment mm -hmm. to help people understand why we're doing this. Why are we crossing ourselves three times before we say the yeah. gospel? Why are we doing that? But to today, adults in my generation, I, I think, are at a, at a severe disadvantage because given the formation that I didn't have, if we're just now starting to recognize that we need to be giving that to our children, and we don't have it to pass on. We don't have it. We're having to go back and read books that were written in the 1940s and, and say, wow, you mean families said a family rosary every night back then? That was a regular practice? I mean, yep. it, if it doesn't come naturally to you, it wasn't something that you were just born into, yeah. um, it's very difficult. And there's an example of why, uh, you know, as communities of Catholics need to, re even though our communities oh, yeah. are kind of broken up, they're not quite the way maybe the Catholic community used to be, and, mm -hmm. and that might be a bit of a, a glorification of the past anyway, mm -hmm. but in reality, we live in, sure. in neighborhoods, we're surrounded by people of all different ilks, and, and a lot of that's indifferentism. Ah, it doesn't matter what church you go to. You know, that's right. the attitude. So how do you con convey to your kids it does make a difference? And if you're a parent like yourself that is going to take the time to read those books, then you can learn that stuff. But if you don't even know that it's important to learn that stuff, then you don't have what you need to pass on to your children so they, they themselves can have it. And it drifts out of our culture it gets worse very quickly. Worse. Spirals. Yeah. It, so that's why we have EWTN. Yay. I mean, that's why we're doing this, to encourage us and our faith, to appreciate this great faith that we have. For those of you that aren't Catholics, we want to... Uh, uh, encourage you to explore the fullness of the faith. I mean, yes. That's why we're here. Let's take this next email. This comes from Jennifer in Texas. Carolyn, do you keep in contact with any of your friends from your non-denominational days? If so, what do they think of your journey back home to Rome? God bless. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, that's difficult because when we left and came back to the Catholic Church, um, we were still moving ar around a lot. So actually, no, unfortunately, I don't have any lasting friendships from those pump up the volume churches. However, I, I do have many friends today mm -hmm. who were once Catholic, they were raised Catholic. Some of, some very good friends of mine who might even be watching the show tonight. Um, and it can be a great source of discomfort because a lot of times we have to work very hard to see where we're saying the same thing. We have to work very, very hard to respect one another in the Lord and know that we both have a great love and desire for our Lord. But I have been called to account for some things that I've written on the, on the web for apologetics and where I know one friend in particular was saying, that you think I'm not as good a Christian as you? That's You're so caught up in converting Protestants because you don't think they're as high on the chain as you are. And just realizing that that's not what it's about. Right. What it's about is I know that my friends have a deep love for our Lord and I ache for them because I know that the church they're in doesn't have the fullness that the Catholic Church has to give, the fullness of truth. All right, let's take our next caller, Melody from Oklahoma. Hello, Melody, what's your question? Hi, thanks, Marcus. Yeah. I love the show, Thank and um, thanks for what you do. My question is for Carolyn. I think she has some experience with this. My, um, I'm a, a cradle Catholic, and 
uh, my mother, Catholic, but uh, back in the 70s, she became involved in the charismatic Catholics. And even though now she doesn't, uh, she's not involved in that anymore, um, and she still is in the church, I see so much of what Carolyn was talking about in her practices um, with Mary, with Mass. But we came to an issue that I need some help on how to address her, what I can say. Um, she believes Jesus died once for all her sins, and she's forgiven and she's saved. And we were discussing suffering, and she doesn't see the importance of that in, um, in her life. And I guess I, I just need some, um, some words or some advice. I can maybe speak to her that might reach her and help her see the church's belief in that and how that would help. Melody, first of all, we're going to let you know that I'm asking everyone who's watching right now, just heard your story, to be praying for you and your mother and uh, a breakthrough in that yes. grace for your family because that's where conversion always happens anyway because we need the words that God gives us in mm -hmm. these difficult situations. Mm -hmm. what are your thoughts for Melody, Carolyn? Melody, I remember being there where your mom is. Um, I think on a human side, you really want to believe that a God of love means no suffering. Um, maybe even a little health and wealth gospel attached in there. He, does, he, he wants you healthy and he wants you happy and he wants you full of all the riches of this earth that, that he can provide you today. The reality is that people suffer and good people suffer. And the word tells us that the, the rain falls on the good and the evil alike. And I think there's, there's just a point where someone who believes that is going to have to look at reality and, and admit good people suffer. People that I know that love the Lord suffer and they die. And I think inevitably we all come to a point in our lives where we really have to ask what that suffering is all about. Interestingly, I didn't have to face that until just six years ago when I had cancer and had that opportunity to attach that kind of pain to the cross. I don't know if it's something you can explain without having gone through. You can just continue to be a wonderful, beautiful, loving witness to your mom and respect that she really loves the Lord a great deal. And I think you can rejoice in that and know that if her time comes that she has to face that reality that you are going to be well equipped to be by her side and help her through that. I was thinking it's interesting that question kind of came after a previous comment we had made. I was thinking about making a comment and, and that is that when we want our evangelical friends to come home it's really not that we're making a judgment on their relationship. Oh no. We can't do that. Because Christ called us not to judge lest you be judged. So that's not our job. But what we're hoping that they will see is that we're trying to help them recognize they, their need to move from a false security to a true security. I mean, often in, in those non-Catholic Christian traditions, like the, the mother that was just mentioned mm -hmm. here, you know, that once saved, always saved. Yeah. Well... I mean, it's, you can say that, and uh, just like a banker can say, you give me 10,000 bucks, I'll guarantee in five years it'll, I'll raise it to 50,000. Well, the point is nobody can make that guarantee. And any Bible preacher that just pulls six or seven verses together says that says eternal security doesn't prove that it's true because it doesn't cover the fullness of Scripture. And we want people to have the fullness of the message, yes. not one part of it. So we're not saying this... You had a false security in your once saved, always saved, so now we're going to give you the true security in our once mm. saved, always saved. No, it's, it's understanding what faith really means, that it is a journey. It's a yes. constant surrendering. A true imitation of Christ, which we are called to do. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. If you look at Paul's life and Jesus' life, it involved suffering. Mm -hmm. If we imitate Christ, we recognize that sometimes that that's a necessary part of our journey. Um, and maybe going through a time that seems boring. Yeah. We start to recognize that eventually we see, wait, the problem is me. Yeah. 
not this, it's me. And so we talk about great theology that's getting left behind. What about, explain to those people at home what the, mean, the word means, offer it up. Oh boy. <laughs> but I mean, you got another show? <laughs> well, I know, but, but, but isn't that an important, a powerful yes. theology? It's, Offer it up. It's, it's very, very powerful. And in, in my experience, the closest I could come to the theology behind that meant that at, at some point in my suffering, I had, I mean, in, you know, in the beginning of, of my uh, cancer, I, that whole time that I was in prayer, was was oh, heal me, heal me, Lord. Just just let me wake up tomorrow, and I know it's, I know if it were within your will, I know it's within your power. I know you could heal me right now, and that was my prayer. At at some point, I had become so focused on our Lord's will for me that my prayer became no longer heal me, but I would be going into the hospital for chemo treatments and radiation treatments. And I'd be saying, God, I want you to use the grace from this moment to heal so-and-so. That, to me, was offering it up. Yeah. And I don't think it's something you really force as much as you come to an understanding Come of. to a realization. I mean, it was really yeah. powerful. Yeah. In fact, those of you that are interested in understanding suffering, I can't think of the name of John Paul II's encyclical on suffering. There's mm. a, you know, I can't think of it, but it is, I highly recommend it. You can go to EWTN's religious catalog, you can go to EWTN's website. I'm sure you can get a copy of John Paul's encyclical on suffering. Maybe, I can't think of the name of it, maybe one of you write me an email. But it is basically a Bible study yeah. on the meaning of the Colossians passage where Paul says, I complete what is lacking mm -hmm. in the sufferings of Christ for the church. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? It's in the Bible. And that's the meaning of offering it up and the meaning of suffering. And, and there's so much that suffering does for you. Yeah. It, it doesn't only draw you closer to Christ, but having suffered, you have great compassion yeah. on others who, who suffer. I, you, you see with a, a whole new dimension yeah. of, of compassion that I think helps you bring others closer to our Lord. Yeah, the name of that, uh, they did the producer just gave me the name of that encyclical, uh, Dives or Divis et Misericordia, Misericordia. Mm. And uh, I know that uh, Father Paco, I'm pretty sure, has already gone through that encyclical on his program on Tuesday nights. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Uh, this wonderful Bible study by John Paul on the important meaning of suffering. Let's go with this next email. Steve from Florida writes, dear Marcus and Carolyn, you've mentioned Scott Hahn a few times during the show. Uh, uh, boy, there's an understatement over the last eight years. Yeah. I was wondering where I could find his books. Thank you. Well, first oh. of all, talk a little bit more oh, about, uh, about Scott's tapes and books and okay. their influence well, in the journey. Well, I'll tell you, I think the remarkable thing about Scott Hahn is, um, and this is the power of a witness yeah. uh, all over, but the fact that here was a man who, like yourself, not only was a Protestant, a Bible-believing man, someone who knew his Bible well, but he had moved upward in his church, and he was even teaching at a theological se seminary, and it was because he was delving so deep in the Word that he found the church. And uh, when you get his tapes or books, I mean, he can move pretty fast. Yeah. You got I, I did a lot of rewinding in those early years. What did he say? Yeah. But um, he... He builds such a beautiful case. He is a great storyteller, and he can just kind of put you there and give you a sense of what our Lord is trying to impart. I, he's a wonderful teacher. And I'll, in direct answer to that question, uh, the reality is that, uh, that Scott's uh, writings and uh, tapes are available not only at Catholic bookstores, yeah. but the, you know, Doubleday publishes a number of his most recent books can be found almost anywhere. But go to the EWTN Religious Catalog, and there's a fine selection of his materials there if you're interested in finding out what this person named Scott Hahn has to say, which is, who's had a, such a great influence on so many, not only coming back to the church, but encouraging Catholics to appreciate this great faith. Let's go now to our next caller. Let's see, is this Maureen from New York? Hello, what's your question? Hi, I'm from New Jersey. Oh, New Jersey, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, 
Hi, thank you for your show. Uh, my question for you is about my new neighbors. They are born agains. I know the woman, she left the Catholic Church. She, I'm a practicing Catholic, and I could tell they kind of want to convert me, and of course I want to convert them. <laughs> but I don't know the, the quickest way to do it or, or the most uh, <laughs> successful way to do it. When I tried to have a conversation about purgatory, they told me that um, the book of Maccabees isn't in their Bible. Yeah. You know, so different things. Like I, my question that I told the producer I was going to ask you is, is, is their Bible that different from ours? Okay, good question. She's opened up a lot of questions. She really uh, has. I'll let you do the, the last direct question. Okay. I just want to say that uh, in my experience, it's not very fruitful to get involved in a game of my Bible verse can beat up your Bible verse. Um, Even Protestants don't win against other Protestants on that. No. I mean, it just happens <laughs> no, all the it's, time. It's, it's yeah. so fruitless. It just becomes a big, ugly debate. And I would recommend that, um, again, I, I just see the example that my brother set before me. Living your Catholic faith is a very powerful thing because most Christians today who know most Catholics aren't going to see rosaries and and they're not going to see going to confession on Saturday afternoon or, or leaving for daily mass on Wednesday evening. They're not going to see that as part of the fabric of the lives of their friends who are Catholic. And if, if you are, if you just have that beautiful display of Catholic culture in your home, people who are neighbors are going to see that and at first they're going to be suspicious. But then if all you want to be is their friend, you are going to be the greatest witness to them of the fact that, wow, I, I guess Catholics can oh. know Jesus. And the dialogue will start there instead of the debate. All right. But I didn't an answer her last question. Yeah. The, the About the Bible's being Yeah. Different. And because of time, I want to completely delve into that. You might want to look at the EWTN website. The reality is that, yes, they are different. Um, and the basic difference is that the canon of the what's in the Catholic Bible uh, was the canon of the scriptures throughout mm -hmm. uh, ever since in the late fourth century, uh, the late 300s, that canon was established by the church and that was the norm all the way through. But during the Reformation, there was a decision on a change of the Hebrew canon and that's when the Old Testament was, some Old Testament books were thrown out for a variety of reasons. That's, it's a little complicated to go into, but uh, that's the main issue. In, in apologetics, focus on the, on the common scriptures. Mm -hmm. You know, use the same yeah. Bible. If you can do evangelization, don't, don't, don't let that be the red flag. If they keep bringing that up, say, well, let's, let's don't use those books, because mm -hmm. we've got plenty of other things yes, that absolutely. we can use in the, in the scriptures that we share. Uh, I want to make sure I get in this email, because uh, uh, Shannon, thank you, Shannon, for um, writing to correct us. Uh, she says, hi friends, Salvifici Dolores uh. is the John Paul II encyclical on suffering, the Christian meaning of human suffering. Uh, Davis in Misericordia is the encyclical on the mercy of God. Uh, thank thank you, you very much, Shannon. And uh, for those of you just listening, it's Salvifici Dolores. You've got to get it. It's a great, not necessarily easy, but it's a wonderful, wonderful scripture study on uh, the meaning of suffering. All right. Talking to those folk at home who have been listening to you, maybe someone out there was on the same journey out there, caught up in all the uh, the rah-rah. Uh, mm -hmm. What would you say to them to encourage them to consider making the same journey home you've made? I would say that as a evangelical Christian who truly deeply wants to know the Lord that if you're ready to experience the meat of the gospel where you have to put in the effort and it's no longer being spoon fed to you that there's a place for you to experience that deep incredible worship and it's not a place that depends on the charisma of your leader or the beauty of the music or how you feel on a given day. And that place is the Catholic Church. All right. Thank you, Carolyn. Want to say hello to everybody at home? 
Hi guys! <laughs> <laughs> All watching, I'm sure. Imagine Absolutely. my family. My family might be at your house watching. I'm I not think sure they are. Doing. Okay. <laughs> but thank you very much, Carolyn. Thank you, God Marcus. bless you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. All the questions we've had tonight to Carolyn are excellent questions. And sometimes I, I wonder if some of you who are watching wonder, well, that question must have been asked many times. Well, that's true. Not always. People aren't always watching the Journey Home program every week. Some just started watching. It's all important. The point is we're in this together. We want to help each other come to the fullness of Christ in His church. And that's why the Journey Home is here, as well as EWTN. Thank you. God bless. I'll see you again next week.